Hello class, Dr. Cook here with MS 200 Lesson 35 to talk to you about Paragraph 5, Command and Signal. So when we think about Command and Signal, what we're talking about is where do you put yourself in a position to best control your elements? And how can you create redundancy and communication to achieve your plan and keep higher informed of what you're doing? Here are our learning objectives for this portion of the lecture. Now, here we can see a breakdown of paragraph five from the Ranger Handbook. Really, the three parts that go under it is talking about command. Uh, where is the commander, the leader going to be uh, during the operation by phase? And what is your succession of command? And then control, which includes information about uh, any command posts, where they're going to be when they open and close, um, if they're moving at all, and any reports outside of SOPs that need to get sent up. And then the third uh, subparagraph is the signal portion. Um, and all of your signal information goes in there. There's some examples here from the Ranger Handbook. You'll find other items that can go in there if you look in the Infantry Handbook or, or any of the other um, ATPs or FMs that are out there. For command and control, the key consideration is where can you best command and control your squad leaders? Some other considerations to think about. Uh, what position provides the best situational awareness? Does it allow for reaction and flexibility? Where can your platoon sergeant be best employed for this operation? How about your FO or your medic? Could these factors change throughout the phase of the operation? Leaders may need to be in different places during different phases of the operation. Now, for all of this, the easy button answer about location is that the platoon leader should be at the decisive point and the platoon sergeant should be at the friction point of the operation. Um, and that's kind of the guidepost you can use for where you should be. Your order needs to include a clear succession of command. What happens if the leader becomes a casualty or is otherwise unavailable? Then what? Now, the military has a default system using seniority by rank, date of rank, birth date, all the way down to alphabetical if need be. But is that always the best? Your platoon sergeant might be located at a casual collection point or running a class four or five logistics point. They may not be positioned to take command as quickly as the mission requires. So consider where your leaders are located on the battlefield. Who is in the best position to be able to take over the platoon? Who else is close to the critical point that needs leadership or can actually see the objective to make sound decisions? On any particular mission, consider the strengths and weaknesses of your subordinates. You might have one squad leader that's very good at running an offense, another that's very good at controlling a defense, and a third that understands breaching operations the best. Use those skills to your advantage for mission success. You might also consider your subordinates subordinates. You may have two squad leaders that are roughly equally capable of taking charge of the platoon but one of them may have fresh team leaders that cannot handle a squad, while the other might have an experienced team leader that's fully capable of being an acting squad leader. Think about the ease of the succession plan. You don't want a plan so complex they need to break out the written order and spend five minutes trying to figure out what applies. It may just be easiest to say the succession is first squad leader, second squad leader, third squad leader. Number order is easy to remember and it can get implemented fast. All that said, do give consideration to rank and seniority. If there's a very clear mission reason, you can get away with putting the E5 squad leader ahead of the staff sergeant squad leaders on a rare occasion. But if you repeatedly skip over your most senior squad leader every mission, you're going to have challenges over time that span beyond this single mission. You might then also think about maybe that senior squad leader needs to be somewhere else on the battlefield so that it makes more sense to have them take over the platoon. All right, let's talk about the PACE plan. Now, this is just an acronym that stands for your primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency means of communication. Your primary should be your best and your intended normal method of communication between parties. Your alternate is another common but maybe less optimal method of getting the same thing done. Often, you're monitoring both the primary and alternate all the time. Your contingency method is one that might not be as fast or as convenient as the first two, but it's capable of getting the job done. 
often the receiver is rarely monitoring that method. It's not something you're constantly listening in on. And then finally, you have an emergency method, which is your method of last resort and typically has significant delays or impacts to the mission. And often it's not monitored and only used when the other means fail. An example might be that your primary is secure tactical radio with free cop encryption. That your alternate is secure tactical email. Your contingency is using cell phones and your emergency plan is a runner or also known as a courier hand carrying messages. Now your pace plan will depend on what means are available to you as well as the tactical conditions. Possibilities include wired field phones, commercial landlines, satellite, email, smoke, flares, flags, flashing lights, or any other means that you have available. Some considerations to bear in mind. What do you have available at your level? How will you communicate and control direct fires within the platoon? How will you call for indirect fires outside the platoon? How will you communicate with other leaders like your squad leaders, platoon sergeant, your commander, your FSO? Don't forget about visual methods. How will you mark friendly positions to prevent fratricide? How will you mark enemy positions to control your forces' fires? These methods may vary between day and night. You need to account for weather. You have many options available. All right, here's the page out of the battle book for the command and signal paragraphs. You can see here where you can just write out your succession of command in order. You can put your key leader locations into the table by phase, spell out your pace plan, and then give any passwords, number combinations for challenges. Um, you also can list off your special signals. Uh, an example might be that a green star cluster means to initiate uh, the ambush. Red star cluster means medevac requested. Uh, purple smoke means that a breach lane is open um, or any other signals that you need to complete your mission. So think to yourself about what were examples of these during your FTX or your squad live fire or any other uh, field exercises you've had here at West Point. You've probably seen examples of all of this in the past. All right, this concludes our lecture for this lesson and I look forward to seeing you all in class. Bring your questions and be eager to learn.